Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the stream. I'm Robert from the El Magnifico Games channel and today we're going to continue with our usual Wednesday poetry and riddles. Now this week I thought we would try something slightly different in that I'm going to pull back a bit on the analysis and focus more on the reading of the poem. That's not to say there will be no analysis, but I can't help but wonder if perhaps I can't help but wonder if perhaps there <laughs> my worrying about details such as whether a meter is trochaic or iambic may not necessarily have been um, a particularly popular aspect of this uh, this regular stream and uh, my goodness this, this uh, particular stream hasn't been hasn't been very popular has it so that's the idea we'll see how it goes we'll be beginning with love emblems by uh, John Fletcher which is the last poem re wet re let me try again. We read last week. 
and then we'll move on to some poems that we haven't seen yet. Now, John Fletcher was this gentleman, an English playwright, following William Shakespeare as house playwright for the King's Men, who was among the most prolific and influential dramatists of his day. During his lifetime, and in the Stuart Restoration, his fame rivaled Shakespeare's. So that's who he was. So let's get into it. So, Love's Emblems. Now the lusty spring is seen, golden yellow, gaudy blue, daintily invite the view, everywhere on every green, roses blushing as they blow, and enticing men to pull, lilies whiter than the snow, woodbines of sweet honey full, all love's emblems and all cry, ladies, if not plucked, we die. Yet the lusty spring have stayed, blushing red and purest white, daintily to love invite, every woman, every maid, cherubs kissing as they grow, and inviting men to taste, apples even right below, winding gently to the waist, all love's emblems and all cry, ladies, if not plucked, we die. Hmm. One thought occurs to me, in addition to the analysis I gave last week, I am wondering if perhaps the reference to fruit might possibly be meant as a subtle analogy to anatomical features. Possibly not. But that's something I didn't consider last week. Anyway, let's move on. So, we're still reading uh, some more poems from John Fletcher. And the next poem is entitled, Hear, Ye Ladies. Hear, ye ladies that despise what the mighty love has done. Fear examples and be wise. Fair Callisto was a nun, laid her sailing on the stream to deceive the hopes of man. Love accounting but a dream. Doted on a silver swan, Danaya in a brazen tower, where no love was, love to shower. Here, ye ladies that are coy, what the mighty love can do? Fear the fierceness of the boy, the chaste moon he makes to woo. Vesta, kindling holy fires, circled about with spies, never dreaming loose desires, doting at the altar dies. Ilion, in a short hour, higher he can build, and once more fire. So I detected more than a few mythological references there, which I'm probably going to have to look up. So we have Callisto, we have Leda, we have Denia, which I'm probably mispronouncing. What else do we have? I know the reference to the chased moon. That could be a reference to Cellini, or as we discovered last week, which I think reaffirmed something that we'd read the week before. Uh, apparently, the moon and Cellini were also quite heavily associated with Artemis, whose Roman equivalent was Diana. And Artemis so, most certainly was chaste. So that would also make sense. Ah, and we have Ilion. So let's find out who those figures were um, before we move on. So we have Callisto, a nymph, as well as the moon of Jupiter. In Greek mythology, Callisto was a nymph, or the daughter of King Lys. How would that be pronounced? I have no idea. Like Kayon? Maybe? Like Kayon? I might be a, a million miles off, but I'll go with that. Uh, or the daughter of King Lycaon. The myth varies in such details. She was believed to be one of the followers of Artemis, 
Diana for the Romans, who attracted Zeus. Many versions of Callisto's story survive. According to some writers, Zeus transformed himself into the figure of Artemis to pursue, to pursue Callisto, and she slept with him, believing Zeus to be Artemis. I hadn't heard that one before, that's uh, intriguing. Considering that, as I say, Artemis was famously, I had thought, chased. But now that I think about it in more detail, I think the thing that Artemis specifically vowed was that she would never be with a man. And I hadn't considered that aspect of the mythology. Uh, so, that's an interesting one. Uh, she became pregnant, and when this was eventually discovered, she was expelled from Artemis' group, after which a furious Hera, the wife of Zeus, transformed her into a bear. Although in some versions, Artemis is the one to give her an ursine form. Later, just as she was about to be killed by her son when he was hunting, she was set among the stars as Ursa Major, the Great Bear, by Zeus. She was the bear mother of the Arcadians, through her son Arcus by Zeus. Uh, the fourth Galilean moon of Jupiter and a main belt asteroid are named after Callisto. Okie doke. So what was the context of that? Fair examples and be wise. Sorry, and be wise. Fair Callisto was a nun. Well, it says that she was a follower of Artemis. Now, that wouldn't be a nun as we understand it today because exactly the lifestyle and requirements of a Christian nun would not be the same, I strongly suspect, as a a, um, a priestess in, class in the classical era, but there are certainly strong parallels. Uh, what was the context for that? Here, ye ladies that despise what the mighty love has done. Fear examples and be wise. Fair Callisto was a nun. Okay. Later, sailing on the stream to deceive the hopes of man. Right, who was Later? Uh, in Greek mythology, Later was an Aetolian princess who became a Spartan queen. According to Ovid, that should be Ovid, shouldn't it? According to Ovid, she was famed for her beautiful black hair and snowy skin. Her myth gave rise to the popular motif, motif in Renaissance and later art of Leda and the Swan. Oh no, that's not... This isn't the story where Zeus turns into a swan and seduces a woman, is it? I've got a sneaking suspicion it is. Leda was admired by Zeus who seduced her in the guise of a swan. As a swan, Zeus fell into her arms for protection from a pursuing eagle. The consummation on the same night as Leda lay with her husband, uh, Tyndarius, resulted in two eggs from which hatched Helen, later known as the, the beautiful Helen of Troy, uh, Clytemnestra, and Castor and Pollux, also known as the Dioscuri which children are the progeny of Tidarius the mortal king and which are of Zeus and thus half immortal is not consistent among accounts nor is which child hatched from which egg the split is always is almost always half mortal half divine although the pairings do not always reflect the children's heritage pairings Castor and Pollux are sometimes both mortal sometimes both divine one consistent point is that only one of them is immortal. Oh, sorry, if only one of them is immortal, it is Pollux. It is also always said that Helen is the daughter of Zeus. In Homer's Iliad, Helen looks down from the walls of Troy and wonders why she does not see her brothers among the Achaeans. The narrator remarks that they are both already dead and buried back in the homeland of Lacedaemon thus suggesting that, at least in the Homeric tradition, both were mortal. Another account of the myth states that Nemesis was the mother of Helen, and was also impregnated by Zeus in the guise of a swan. 
A shepherd found the egg and gave it to Leda, who carefully kept it in a chest until the egg hatched. When the egg hatched, Leda adopted Helen as her daughter. This also commemorated uh, the birth of Helen by creating the constellation Cygnus, the swan in the sky. Uh, I do note, however, that where it says... Uh, the narrator remarks that they are both already dead and buried back in the homeland of Lace Daemon. Lace Daemon? I'm not sure. Um, thus suggesting, at least in the Homeric tradition, both were mortal. I had thought that being mortal or being immortal in Greek mythology pertained more to aging and less to physical injury. I could be wrong about that. I'm certainly no expert, but I'm not certain that being an immortal being meant that you couldn't be killed in Greek mythology. Like I say, I think it was more to do with you weren't going to suffer from old age and subsequently die of it. Certainly the immortals weren't immune to physical injury. Famously... Let me get this right in my head. Was... Oh, I'm trying to remember. I think it was Cronus who... castrated his father, Saturn? Is that correct? Oh no, he was considered Saturn. Who was his father? That is in the Roman tradition he was Saturn. Uranus. Yes, that would be it. Uh, who was... R uh, Roman equivalent was Catelus, who I hadn't heard of. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought I had that mixed up in my head. Um, so Cronus, also known as Saturn, famously castrated his father Cronus. So absolutely they were uh, susceptible to physical injury. So you'd assume they could be killed? Anyway, this is going a bit off topic. Returning to the matter of the poem... Uh, later, sailing on the stream to deceive the hopes of man. Well, the reference to later gives us another example of a woman who was seduced by Zeus. I'm not sure what the reference to the stream is, though. No. Uh, so I don't know what that is, a sp is specifically a reference to. What else do we have? Love accounting, but a dream, doted on a silver swan, denier. Right, who's that then? In Greek mythology, denier, which I'm probably mispronouncing, was an Argive priestess and mother of the hero Perseus by Zeus. By Zeus. She was credited with the founding... Uh, with founding the city of Ardea in Latium, during the Bronze Age. Disappointed by his lack of male heirs, King Acrisius asks the Oracle of Delphi if this would change. The Oracle announced to him he would never have a son, but his daughter would, and that he would be killed by his daughter's son. At the time, Denial was childless and, meaning to keep her so, King Acrisius shut her up in a bronze chamber to be constructed under the court of his palace. Other versions version say she was imprisoned in a tall brass tower with a single richly adorned chamber but with no doors or windows just a skylight as the source of light and air she was buried in this tomb 
with the intent that she be closed off from all others for the rest of her life. However, Zeus, the king of the gods, desired her and came to her in the form of golden rain which streamed in through the roof of the subterranean chamber and down into her womb. Soon after, the child Perseus was born. Unwilling to provoke the wrath of the gods or the Furies by killing his offspring and grandchild, King Acrisius cast Denia and Perseus into the sea in a wooden chest. The sea was calmed by Poseidon and, at the request of Zeus, the pair survived. They were washed ashore on the island of Seriphus, where they were taken in by the Dic uh, Dictes, the brother of King Polydex. Decus. Polydecus? Uh, who raised Perseus to manhood. The king was charmed by Denia, but she had no interest in him. Consequently, he agreed not to marry her, only if her son would bring him the head of the Gorgon Medusa. Uh, using Athena's shield, Hermes' winged sandals, and Hades' helmet of invisibility, Perseus was able to evade Medusa's gaze and decapitate her. Oh, so it was Perseus that did that. Okay. Later, after Perseus brought back Medusa's head and rescued Andromeda, sorry, Andromeda, the oracle's prophecy came true. He started for Argus, but learning of the prophecy, instead went to Larissa, where athletic games were being held. By chance, an aging Acrisus was there, and Perseus accidentally struck him on the head with his javelin or discus, fulfilling the prophecy. Hmm. Accidentally. Anyway, so that gives us yet another um, example of a woman that was impregnated by Zeus. Denia, in a brazen tower where no love was, loved to shower. Yes, that is consistent with the uh, mythology. Here, ye ladies, that are coy, that the mighty love can do. Fear the fierceness of the boy, the chaste moon he makes to woo. Vesta kindling holy fires. Uh, Vesta. Now, I'm familiar with the Vestal Virgins of Rome, who were, as the name would suggest, virgins, and were responsible for... Keeping a particular fire alight, I believe, that was thought to have mythological significance. Vesta is the virgin goddess of the hearth, home, and family in Roman religion. Oh, okay, then she must be the Roman equivalent of the Greek. Oh, who was it? I'm going to look it up. Hestia. She was rarely depicted in human form, and was more often represented by the fire of her temple in the Forum Romanum. Entry to her temple was permitted only to her priestess. The Vestal Virgins, who guarded particular sacred objects within, prepared flour and sacred salt, uh, molla salsa, for official sacrifices, and tended Vesta's sacred fire at the temple hearth. Their virginity was thought essential to Rome's survival. If found guilty of inchastity, they were buried or entombed alive. As Vesta was considered a guardian of the Roman people, her festival, the Vestalia, the 7th to 15th of June, was regarded as one of the most important Roman holidays. During the Vestalia, privileged matrons walked barefoot through the city to the temple, where they presented food offerings. Such was Vesta's importance to Roman religion that following the rise of Christianity, hers was one of the last non-Christian cults still active till it was forcibly disbanded by the Christian Emperor Theodosius I in AD 391. That is quite late. The myths depicting Vesta and her priestesses were few. The most mo the most notable of them were tales of miraculous impregnation of a virgin priestess by a phallus appearing in the flames of the sacred hearth. Hmm. The manifestation of the goddess combined with a male supernatural being. In some Roman traditions, Rome's founders, Romulus and Remus, 
and the benevolent king Servius Tullius were conceived in this way. Vesta was among the Dil Consentes, twelve of the most honoured gods in the Roman pantheon. She was the daughter of Saturn and Ops, and sister of Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto, Juno, and Ceres. A Greek equivalent is Hestia. Uh, so Vesta, kindling holy fires, circled round about with spies, never dreaming Lustre's eyes, doting at the altar dies. Ilion, in short hour, higher he can build, and once more fire. Uh, I didn't... See a reference there. To... Zeus or Jupiter. That is in keeping with the previous examples we saw. Although clearly... Intercourse is still a theme here. So who was the last one? Ilion. Uh, still not seeing an individual called it. It seems to be an archaic name for the pre-classical city of Troy. Uh, oh, hence the title of Homer's Iliad. few Greek cities and towns of that name. Otherwise nothing. Hmm. Ilion in a short hour. Higher he can build. And once more fire. Nope. Can't follow that reference. Just going over it a second time. Yep, no idea what that's about. So, once more from the top. Hear, ye ladies that despise what the mighty love has done. Fear examples and be wise. Fair Callisto was a nun. Laid a sailing on the stream to deceive the hopes of man. Love accounting but a dream. Doted on a silver swan. Denier in a brazen tower. Where no man was, love to shower. Hear, ye ladies that are coy, what the mighty love can do. Hear the fierceness of the boy, the chase moon he makes to woo. Vesta, kindling holy fires, circled round about with spies, never dreaming loose desires, doting at the altar dies. Ilion, in a short hour, higher he can build, and once more fire. So I think it's fair to say that some of that is lost on me, I'm sorry to say. But the overall theme appears to be what's introduced in the first few verses, which is that the poem itself seems to be a seems to be cautionary in nature. It seems to be warning women to guard their chastity. And the tales that it introduces are where are of women who had otherwise been chased, but or at least some of the examples it gives are of women in mythology who had otherwise been chased, but in one way or another had been seduced or tricked. Um, in some very elaborate and surprising ways. So yes, not sure what more to say about that. Let's keep going. God. Lie. What's that? Lie. Aeus? Lie Aeus? Possibly? Uh, let's see if we can find out what that is. Oh, is it another name for Dion uh, Dionysus? Because that's where I got redirected. Uh, in ancient Greek religion and myth, Dionysus is the god of grape harvest, 
winemaking, orchards and fruit, vegetation, fertility, festivity, insanity, ritual madness, religious ecstasy and theatre. Romans called him Bacchus for a frenzy he is said to induce called Bacchaea. As Dionysus Eleutherius, the liberator, his wine, music and ex ecstatic dance free his followers from self-conscious fear and care and subvert the oppressive restraints of the powerful. His Thyrsus, a fennel stern scepter, sometimes wound with ivy and dripping with honey, is both a beneficent wand and a weapon used to destroy those who oppose his cult and the freedoms he represents. Those who partake of his mysteries are believed to become possessed and empowered by the god himself. Uh, right, let's see if we can find out why we were redirected here. Epithets. Okay, so this is one of his many epithets then. Uh, li Liasis, I think. Deliverer, literally loosener, one who releases from care and anxiety. Interesting. Okay. So... I don't know what this is going to be about, but it suggests that it's going to be about uh, delivery from restraint in some way. Possibly induced by drink, possibly not. We'll have to see. Uh, maybe I should actually look up how that's pronounced. Since I can see from that I'm actually going to have to pronounce it, at least in the first verse. Uh, yeah, I seem to be out of luck on that front. Wiktionary doesn't have it. Uh, tell you what, let's look at the first couple of verses, and at the very least, let's see if I can work out how many syllables this should be. So we have God, then the word, ever young. So that's four plus however many syllables that is. Ever honoured ever sung. So that's four, that's three, so it's two syllables. That's an... Ever honoured, ever sung. Ever honoured, ever sung. That's an interesting meter, because we start on a strong beat and end on one as well, and it's seven syllables. Like a docked trochaic tetrameter. Anyway. So, it should be two syllables. I'm going to go with Laius. That might be a long way off. I'll tell you at least why I'm thinking Laius, because I'm pretty sure the A-E would make an A sound, somewhere between A and A. A. The U-S, I can only assume, would be us. As for the Y, I don't know what that would do, but my guess is that it's... Although it may although it may serve a very important function in transliterating from Greek, it's probably redundant in English. Of course that may represent it being mispronounced in English. But I don't see how having a Y there would make me pronounce what follows any differently. But then again, that may just be because I don't know how to pronounce it. So I'm gonna go with Laius even though that may be wrong. So, let's carry on. God lay us. God lay us, ever young, ever honoured, ever sung, stained with blood of lusty grapes, in a thousand lusty shapes, dance upon the maze's brim, in the crimson liquor swim, from thy pl pl 
Pl plenteous hand divine, let a river run with wine. God of youth, let this day here enter neither care nor fear. Right, what's a mazer? A bowl of maple wood. Dance upon the mazer's brim. I'm guessing that that's a bowl that you might drink wine from then. Looking at Wiktionary, obsolete, the maple tree or maple wood, archaic or historical, a large drinking bowl made from such wood, a mazer bowl. So indeed. So I would suggest this is about drinking wine then, and forgetting life's worries. Let me uh, try reading it once more. God lay us, ever young, ever honoured, ever sung. Stained with blood of lusty grapes, in a thousand lusty shapes, dance upon the mazer's brim, in the crimson liquor swim, from thy plenteous hand divine, let a river run with wine. God of youth, let this day here enter neither care nor fear. I mean, you must admit, for what it is, it's very nice. I'm sure there's many people that would find um, a lot positive to say about the sentiments that's expressed here. Although, I can't help but think that to a modern audience, there are going to be some possible concerns here that it may express an alcoholic's point of view, particularly those that use alcohol to escape from stressful circumstances but on the other hand you could argue that how is what's written here inconsistent with just taking a a day out to have some nice wine out in the open the sun shining beautiful grounds around you and relax and in and for a day enjoy yourself like Perhaps that's the sentiment they were going for. Anywho, let's keep going. Beauty clear and fair. Beauty clear and fair. Where the air, rather like a perfume dwells. Where the violet and the rose, their blue veins and a blush disclose. And come to honour nothing else. Where to live near and planted there, is to live and still live new. Where to gain a favour is, more than light, perpetual bliss. Make me live by serving you. Dear, again back recall to this light, a stranger to himself and all, both the wonder and the story shall be yours, and eke the glory. I am your servant and your thrall. Goodness, what do we have here then? Beauty clear and fair, where the air, rather like a perfume dwells. That's a nice simile. Do I mean simile or do I mean metaphor? I suppose I mean metaphor. Where the violet and the rose, their blue veins and blush disclose, and come to honour nothing else. That's more ambiguous because it hasn't introduced yet what it is that they do honour. It's only established the fact that they don't honour anything else. Where to live near and planted there is to live and still live new. Where to gain a favour is more than light, perpetual bliss. Make me live by serving you. Okay, so I think the next, the, the first, of the verses I've just read, I think the first three are only denoting the desirability of proximity to something, and it hasn't introduced the thing yet. Where to live near and planted there is to live and still like live new. To, and still live new. 
Is that just implying the desirability of new life as if seeing the world through a child's eyes but it's written in such a matter-of-fact way it's as though it just expects that the reader would know exactly what it means without explaining it any further that's the only way it makes sense to me as if it's just assuming that you would think that new life is better than old life for some reason and that therefore this is a good thing uh, it's a good thing that um, to be in proximity to this thing not yet disclosed will make you still live as new where to gain a favour is more than light perpetual bliss so that's an interesting metaphor perpetual bliss and light I suppose that also by implication suggests a suggests that the thing being described is goodly or righteous because that's those are things that are heavily also associated with light in contrast to darkness the the imagery of light being cast upon darkness and destroying it is also obviously a very a very old metaphor for good defeating evil so far as I understand it anyway make me live by serving you and so here we finally have the verse which puts most of the verses up till now into context uh, to be fair we did a beauty clear and fair which gave us an address so I suppose you could say that y the reader would naturally assume these three verses were referring to living near beauty so with the, the final verse of the second stanza make me live by serving you I suppose the only question that remains is where it says beauty clear and fair is this referring to serving beauty itself as an abstract thing or is beauty clear and fair being used as a sort of pet name for a romantic interest and they're asking to serve they're asking that person if they may serve them and the verses in between are just an explanation for how desirable that would be for them that is desirable for the ser person asking to serve dear again back recall to this light right so just by using the word dear one word they've cleared up all that ambiguity they are not serving beauty in some abstract sense this is a person again back recall to this light so recall the light presumably the light that I had just spoken about a stranger to himself and all recall can also mean move backwards can't it nowadays we would tend to use it in an um, in a more abstract rather than literal sense abstract's not quite the right word I'm trying to think what the right word would be um, like you might recall a good which would mean bringing it back to where it came from but doesn't necessarily refer to moving backwards literally but I think we would also say although this is slightly archaic I think we might also say so and so recalled in horror meaning that they uh, stepped back and were um, startled or terrified or something along those lines I'm fairly certain that's right and I'm not making it up figurative more than abstract that, that was the word I was trying to think of 
Yeah, to withdraw, retract. Yeah, retract. Ah, ret retract is more what I was thinking of, although it does says ones, words, etc. Anyway. Where were we? Dear, again, back recall to this light. So does it mean think back as in remember? Or does it mean walk back into the light? A stranger to himself and all. Oh, I think it's asking them to bring the stranger back into the light. Dear, again, back recall to the light, a stranger to himself and all. So the reference to someone being a stranger to themselves and to all is an interesting one. That's very specific, and I'm not sure what the implications are supposed to be in this case. Both the wonder and the story shall be yours and eke the glory. Of course, bringing something to light can also refer to exposing the truth. Because we sometimes use darkness to denote obscurity. And then casting a light upon it is then a metaphor for, uh, for removing the obscurity. So it can, for example, refer to the acquisition of knowledge or the solving of a mystery. So, I may be wrong about this, but reading those five verses, it makes me think like there's a mixed metaphor here, which is between light being used as a symbol of beauty and goodliness to describe the individual, or at least the radiance emanating from the individual under discussion, the subject, if you will. But then also, they're then mixing in this metaphor for an individual being confused and the proximity to this idealized um, this idealized romantic uh, figure of romantic interest helping them find themselves so bringing to light their true nature and then the reference to both the wonder and the story shall be yours and eke the glory is saying that not only will you be doing this good thing for this individual but you also stand to gain from it this is to your advantage I am your servant and your thrall now thrall is a very strong term for a servant I believe it tends to be used to refer to um, those that have been or at least nowadays it would tend to be used to refer to those that have been magically charmed to be under somebody else's power. But we also use it more figuratively in words like enthrall, to, which is to have someone's... which is to cause someone else to be completely to have their attention completely pulled towards something in, in, in its entirety to to find something truly compelling so this is quite a strong way of indicating that they are 
in the service of somebody else. To be one's thrall is even stronger than to be one's servant, I would suggest. Uh, and I would conclude that they are a... that the, the individual here is... the subject of the poem is a romantic interest for three reasons. First is the reference to deer. Second is beauty. And why would you be talking about beauty if you're not dealing with subjects such as love or... Um... love or lust. I suppose strictly speaking if you're talking about aesthetics in the abstract, like you might say something is a a beautiful vase, that doesn't mean that you feel um, romantically towards the vase, you just mean that it is a aesthetically pleasing. But uh, I don't think there's much support for that elsewhere, especially since we've established that we seem to be talking about an individual. And finally, because of course love's poetry is a... Well, love within poetry is an extremely popular theme. Ubiquitous, I would go so far as to say. That's not to say every poem is uh, love poetry, but that it... But the body of poetry devoted to love makes up a, a vast subset of all poetry. That and death seem to be the two, or meditations on death, seem to be the two most uh, attested themes of all. At least in the English language poetry that we've been looking at. Anyway, that's what I would conclude about this poem. I don't know if anyone disagrees, if you do, or would just like to leave some sort of comment, something you've noticed, something you find interesting, something you'd like me to look at in more detail, please leave a comment. Uh, for now, I think I will read this once more, and then we'll move on to the next one. Beauty clear and fair, where the air, rather like a perfume dwells, where the violet and the rose, their blue veins and blush disclose, and come to honour nothing else. Where to live near and planted there is to live and still live new, where to gain a favour is more than light, perpetual bliss. Make me live by serving you. Dear, again back recalled to this light, a stranger to himself and all, both the wonder and the story shall be yours and eke the glory. I am your servant, and your thrall. I just noticed, um, so it's not just a plea to become someone's servant and their thrall. There are very strong implications in the second verse that to be permitted to be their servant is going to actually give them life. I suppose this is a metaphor extending upon the idea that life has no meaning if something or other isn't the case. They're taking that one step further and suggesting that they have no life without it. Um, which is consistent with the reference to them not knowing themselves, I would suggest. It's not the same statement. But I mean, I think it all contributes towards the same general impression. Anyway, we move on to another poem. This time encountered, sorry, this time entitled Melancholy. Hence, all you vain delights, short as are the nights wherein you spend your folly, there's naught in this sweet, in this life sweet. If men were wise to seek, but only melancholy, a oh sweetest melancholy, welcome, folded arms and fixed eyes, a sight that piercing mortifies, a look that fastened to the ground, a tongue chained up without a sound. 
Fountain heads and pathless groves, places which pale passion loves. Moonlight walks when all the fowls are warmly housed, save bats and owls. At midnight bell, a parting groan. These are the sounds we feed upon, then stretch our bones in a stormy, in a still gloomy valley. Nothing so dainty, nothing so dainty sweet as lovely melancholy. I apologise, I'm not sure I read that one all that well. <laughs> what are we dealing with? That was another one that I'm going to have to look at in more detail. Hence all you vain delights, as short as are the nights, wherein you spend your folly. Spend your folly. Now a folly is, well it can mean several things, it can mean something which is false. But it can also mean something which is foolish, can it not? Foolishness that results from lack of foresight or lack of practicality. Thoughtless action resulting in tragic consequences. Uh, a fanciful building built for purely ornamental reasons. Well, not that one, obviously. A pinkish red colour? I didn't know that. Hmm, perhaps it can't mean something which is false then. I suppose I was getting confused with the meaning of a fanciful building built for purely ornamental reasons. Yes, yeah, spend your folly. So I assume that means doing, uh, committing actions which aren't well thought out and may have negative consequences. There's not in this life sweet if men were wise to seat that that must be a shortening of it i suppose an abbreviation so if men were wise to see it except for reasons of scansion it's been abbreviated but only melancholy oh sweet is melancholy mm, what is it actually saying here there's naught in life, there's naught in this life sweet, if men were wise to see it. It's probably saying both that there is nothing in life sweet and that it's And if men were had possessed wisdom, then they'd be able to see that fact. But the use of the word "if" actually implies that it's uh, that it's only well. It, impl it implies a condition doesn't it as though the only reason that nothing in life is sweet is because is is because and when men are wise enough to see that there is nothing sweet as though it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you're wise enough to see that there's nothing in life sweet then you will find there is nothing in life sweet that's what I think it says literally, so far as my understanding of English grammar is concerned, but I'm not convinced that's what the poet meant. I think they more likely meant the former. That there is nothing in life sweet, and then the next verse is just a general lament of, you know, if only men were wise enough to see this. Anyway, but only melancholy. Oh, sweetest melancholy. Oh, okay. That's an interesting contradiction. There's naught in this life sweet, but only sweetest melancholy. The idea of sweet melancholy I don't think is in any way new. 
I mean, okay, strictly speaking, this is an old poem. I don't know that this isn't where the idea originated from, but I highly, highly doubt it. The idea that there can be a type of sadness which is sweet, even sickly sweet, is nothing new, I don't think. But yes, there's an obvious contradiction here, because they say there's nothing sweet, and then they say only melancholy. Anyway, welcome. Folded arms and fixed eyes. A sight that piercing mortifies. Interesting reference to body language. So all it's referring to is someone that has their arms folded and is fixing you with a stare. That is to say, their eyes are unwaveringly on you. Apparently that's both piercing and mortifies. A look that's fastened to the ground. A tongue chained up without a sound. A look that's fastened to the ground. Does that just mean that it's unmoving? So once they have that expression upon them, they don't change it? Or is there something more being implied here? A tongue chained up without a sound. So they're, they're fixing you with a stare, but they feel... Um, overwhelmingly as though they shouldn't speak, for whatever reason. Fountain heads and pathless groves, places which pale passion loves. Moonlight walks when all the fowls are warmly housed, save bats and owls. Ah, oh, that's a nice reference. So that's just talking about the fact that the birds will all be cosy and warm in their nests. Aside from bats and owls which come out at night. A midnight bell, a parting groan. These are the sounds we feed upon. So now we seem to have references to meetings at night, which must end. End at midnight, in fact. Which, although we don't have enough evidence to support it, I would suggest is probably a reference to illicit meetings of lovers. Then stretch our bones in a still gloomy valley. Nothing so dainty sweet as lovely melancholy. That's interesting. Then stretch our bones in a still gloomy valley. Nothing so dainty sweet as lovely melancholy. What is that a reference to? I mean, it, to a modern audience, the reference to bones and valleys could be innuendo. And I certainly wouldn't put it past an Elizabethan to have done so deliberately. But even if that were the case, then that would have been disguised. That would have been double entendre. There would have at least been another more literal and more obvious interpretation. And it's that that is eluding me. Stretch our bones. I mean, is that just a reference to stretching? To, you know, as you might if you were tired, stretching out your limbs? Why in a gloomy valley? I mean, the gloom could be because it's night, but why are they in a valley? Also, I don't think the reason for the melancholy is ever explained. My best guess is that it is because they are parting from this this person they wish they could this love interest they wish they could see more openly Although, again, th this is very heavily my reading between the lines. There's very little here to...
Th there's not a lot here to support that aside aside from cultural context. Nothing so dainty sweet as lovely melancholy. What do they mean by dainty? I would think dainty would mean sort of small and possibly fragile. Elegant, delic delicately small and pretty. Fastidious and fussy, especially when eating. Excellent, valuable, fine. Dainty sweet. Well, in this case, sweet is being used as an adjective, so we'd be looking for an adverb, presumably. None of which these definitions of dainty are. Let's check my physical dictionary for dainty. Perhaps that can shed some light on the issue. Shed some light. That uh, is a good example of the metaphor I was discussing earlier in one of the previous poems. In terms of darkness representing the some think in intellectual obscurity and the light representing knowledge right dainty dainty noun that's not what we're looking for dainty that says a which I would assume is adjective delicate choice tasteful pretty of delicate beauty, scrupulously clean, particular, nice, of delicate taste and sensibility, fastidious. Okay, what is fastidious? I assumed it meant fussy, roughly. Excessively particular, demanding, or fussy. It does. Uh, inclined to luxury, hence illy. Adverb, inus. Oh, sorry. Hence, illy, adverb, or enus, noun. Yeah, dainty sweet doesn't make sense to me. That should be daintily sweet. Ignoring scansion. Unless it's applying both adjectives at the same time. So it's an abbreviation of dainty and sweet. Nothing so dainty and sweet as lovely melancholy. That must be it. So excellent and sweet. Right, so from the top. Hence, all you vain delights, as short as are the nights, wherein you spend your folly, there's naught in this life sweet. If men were wise to seat, but only melancholy, oh, sweetest melancholy, welcome, folded arms and fixed eyes, a sight that piercing mortifies, a look that's fastened to the ground, a tongue chained up without a sound, fountain heads and pathless groves, places which pale passion loves, moonlight walks when all the fowls are warmly housed, save bats and owls, a midnight bell, a parting groan, these are the sounds we feed upon, and stretch our bones in a still gloomy valley, nothing so dainty sweet as lovely melancholy. Okay, I think I understand it, but only because of um, cultural knowledge and context. I don't think there's enough information in itself to fully explain it. 
Which is interesting. The danger is that my understanding of what it means could be... Well, it could be wrong, because I live about 400 years after this was written. Um, but let's read it from the top and I'll tell you what I think it probably means. Hence, all you vain delights. I think vain delights is probably a reference to carnality. Uh, as short as are the nights. That's because they only occur at night. They are short as the nights because they happen at night. Wherein you spend your folly. So this is talking about the recklessness of pursuing carnality. It may be something which is pleasing, but it's also risky. There's naught in this life sweet, if men were wise to see it, but only melancholy. Oh, sweet is melancholy. Now this could be a reference to the fact that when you conduct a relationship in secret, that you feel a great deal of sadness. And shame. Because it, cause if it's something you're hiding, then clearly it's something that you don't want others to know about. It's, it is, by its very nature, something you're likely to feel ashamed about. Or it's possible that the reference to sweetest melancholy is more... I think the former definition is the most likely one, but it's possible it could also be a reference to just more general sadness. As you might expect from someone that has failed to find love in life in the more traditional ways. This might be uh, an indirect allusion to some form of depression. Again, I think the former is more likely, but it is a possibility that we should be open to, I'd suggest. Uh, welcome folded arms and fixed eyes. A sight that piercing mortifies. So this is a reference to them being judged by other people for what they've been up to, I would suggest. A look that's fastened to the ground, a tongue chained up without a sound. And this is the last bit is because they other people may be judging them, but out of properness, they're not going to say anything about it. They may not approve, but without, uh, but it's not their business, and especially without very credible evidence, they're unlikely to come out and say anything about it. So they just get judging looks, but no, no other immediate re repercussions. Fountain heads and pathless groves pathless, I would suggest, either because the place where they're meeting is off the beaten path, or it might just generally be a reference to it being at dark, in the dark, so finding your way is difficult. Places which pale passion loves. Uh, pale isn't... I don't know why they're calling it pale passion. There probably is a reason. But I don't know. But Passion obviously alludes to carnality, I would suggest. Moonlight walks when all the fowls are warmly housed, save bats and owls. We've discussed that one already. A midnight bell, a parting groan. Now that parting groan could be innuendo. These are the sounds we feed upon. So this is, this is interesting. The metaphor of consumption, uh, which could be taken one step further to suggest that this is something that is seen as necessary for life.
then stretch up bones in a still gloomy valley. Now this could be a reference to as they're walking away, they are being active and therefore stretching their bones, or as I say, that could also be innuendo. Nothing so dainty sweet as lovely melancholy. So again, a reference to... I think what they're trying to get come, trying trying to get across here, is the idea that this sort of relationship, this sort of conduct, is bittersweet, as we would describe it today. It's sad, but it's also pleasing in a way which makes it. Perhaps even you could go so far as saying addictive. It feels necessary. As though if we weren't able to feed upon it, to use the poem's own metaphor, we wouldn't be complete. That's my interpretation, but again, as I say, I'm having to use quite a lot of just general... Uh, just general knowledge from outside the poem itself. So I could be very wrong. If you have a strong opinion and you would like to express it, then by all means leave a comment. Let's carry on. So the next poem is entitled Weep No More. Weep no more, nor sigh nor groan. Sorrow calls, no time that's gone. Violet is plucked, the sweetest rain makes not fresh nor grow again. Trim thy locks, look careful, look cheerfully. Fate's hid ends eyes cannot see. Joyce's winged dreams fly fast, why should sadness longer last? Grief is but a wound to woe, gentlest fair, mourn, mourn no mo. Interesting. Weep no more, nor sigh nor groan. Sorrow calls no time that's gone. Interesting. So the first verse is certainly expressing the sentiment that you should stop being melancholic. Sorrow calls no time that's gone. I'm not sure what that is referring to. What does it mean by calls? Sorrow calls, no time that's gone. Violet's plucked, the sweetest rain makes not fresh nor grow again. Oh, violets plucked, the sweetest rain makes not fresh nor grow again. So, once you've plucked the violets, even though you may be doing so for the best reasons, nothing's going to turn back time. They are going to slowly decay and that's it. So, sorrow calls no time that's gone probably means that being sad I think by call it means in the sense of summon as in the king summoned the royal blacksmith meaning he wanted the royal blacksmith to turn up in person to speak with him um, and in that sense I think sorrow calls no time that's gone means that being sad about something that's happened isn't going to bring back happier days. What's happened has happened, we can only move on. Trim thy locks, look cheerfully. So trim thy locks, I think, is just 
a reference to cutting your hair and I think that's specifically there to suggest that the individual that has been very sad uh, hasn't been taking proper care of themselves in terms of their their physical presentation they've been letting things slip look cheerfully so try to look happy fate's hid ends eyes cannot see fate's hid ends eyes cannot see okay so you can't see the future fate's hid ends is referring to uh, fate meaning destiny so the things that are inevitably going to happen and hid ends refer to the future the, th the parts of fate that you cannot see so fate's hid ends eyes cannot see you can't see the future so trim your hair try to look happy you can't see the future joys as winged dreams fly fast why should sadness longer last um, so happy times last such a short time anyway why dwell on sad things although very well expressed I would say why should sadness longer last grief is but a wound to woe gentlest fair mourn mourn no more grief is but a wound to woe so grief What do you mean by two woe? Because woe is itself a a deep seated sadness. Although woe can also refer to negative events, can't they, in the sense of wheel and woe. Great sadness or distress, a misfortune causing such sadness. Yes, a, m a misfortune causing such sadness. Uh, calamity, trouble. Um, so grief is but a wound to woe. So grief is the equivalent. Grief is to woe or to wound is to physical imagery. Uh, physical um, injury or to put it another way grief is to a misfortunate event what a wound is to a to physical injury is I think what it's saying here grief is but a wound to woe gentlest fair mourn mourn no mo clever little rhyme there with woe but uh, in essence it's saying Mourn, that is have your moment of sadness, then move on. Don't let it linger. So yep, I think we've analysed this one uh, as much as is necessary. So let's keep going. Oh, we move on to a new poet now, John Webster. So who was John Webster? John Webster was an English Jacobean dramatist, best known for his tragedies The White Devil and The Duchess of Malfi, which are often seen as masterpieces of the early 17th century English stage. His life and career overlapped with Shakespeare's. Uh, we'll skip the more detailed biography for the point of uh, for the purposes of expediency a dirge now a dirge is a funeral song I believe call for the robin redbreast and the wren since o'er shady groves they hover with leaves and flowers to cover the friendless bodies of unburied men Call unto his funeral doll, 
the ant, the field mouse, and the mole, to rear him hillocks that shall keep him warm, and, when gay tombs are robbed, sustain no harm, but keep the walls far thence, that's foe to men, for which his nails he'll dig them up again. Interesting. So what do we actually have here? Call for the robin redbreast and the wren, since our shady groves they hover. That may be so... what is the implication? I'm not sure. And with leaves and flowers to cover the friendless bodies of unburied men. Interesting. The friendless bodies of unburied men. Call unto his funeral doll. The ant, the field mouse, and the mole. To rear him hillocks that shall keep him warm. So, in other words, bury them. And, when gay tombs are robbed, sustain no harm. I think the analogy there is suggesting that more elaborate tombs may be robbed, but just some simple dirt piled over someone won't suffer the same fate. But keep the wolf far as thence, that's foe to men, for with his nails he'll dig them up again. So, that, so the idea here is that a wolf might dig up a body that's been buried. See, the funny thing about this is I feel like I understand each part individually. It makes literal sense. But the bigger picture is going over my head. I feel like each part is probably meant to be some sort of metaphor that, that is um, supposed to combine together to give the overall meaning of the poem, and that is specifically what I'm missing. Right, I want to look up doll. I'm familiar with doll in the sense of on the doll, as in on Job Seekers Allowance, I think it's, well, certainly was called at some point. I'm not sure if that's what it's still called now. But I can only imagine funeral doll in something else entirely. Right, doll, lot, destiny. Happy man be as doll. May be ha may he be happy. Charitable distribution. Uh, charitable gift of food, clothes or money. The doll, colloquial relief, claimable by the unemployed. Uh, deal out sparingly, especially as arms. Also doll, poetic, grief, woe, lamentation. Revived, obsolete word of doel. Now, dual, mourning. Oh, I just noticed the previous world, doldrums, dullness, dumps, depression. I wonder if doldrums and dull in the poetic sense, meaning grief or woe, have a joint etymology. It seems quite likely, doesn't it? Oh, it says it probably formed on dull. Compare tantrums. The geographical sense probably due to mistake. Oh yeah, region of calm and light baffling winds near equator. Huh. Right, so the poetic sense is 
Whoa, grief. So where did we read that? Call unto his funeral doll. The ant, the field mouse and the mole. Well, of the three definitions, that is destiny, or charitable distribution, or woe grief, uh, the latter most is the most likely, although I still feel it doesn't fully figure, call unto his funeral dull, so call unto his funeral grief. The ant, the field mouse, and the mole. The only thing I can think is that possibly they're using... No, that doesn't make sense. No, I'm not sure. Well, ostensibly, the poem seems to be about... A poor individual that died friendless and therefore went unburied and various animals are being called upon to help improve the situation and specifically the robin redbreast the wren um, The ant, the field mouse, and the mole are all thought to help in various ways, whereas the wolf would be a problem. But it's not entirely clear why the poem is saying these things. Again, I feel like I can understand the literal sense of it, but not the metaphors behind it. Perhaps that should be the metaphors on top of it. Uh, also, interesting that they refer to the wolf as the foe to man, given that man ultimately domesticated the wolf and created the dog, which is thought to be, as they say, man's best friend. I mean, I'm not saying wolves haven't been a problem in human history. They have. But it's strange for them to be portrayed as a universally negative animal in this poem. I mean, historically speaking, wolves were respected and seen as fierce, formidable animals. Hence Romulus and Remus being raised by a, a she-wolf. Anywho. So the next poem we move on to is called The Shrouding of the Duchess of Malfi, which I note we heard about the Duchess of Malfi before um, when we were reading about this poet. An English Jacobean dramatist best known for his tragedies, The White Devil and the Duchess of Malfi. Uh, the Duchess of Malfi is a Jacobean revenge tragedy written by English dramatist John Webster in 1612 to 1613 was first performed privately at the Blackfriars Theatre, then later to a larger audience at the Globe in 1613 to 1614. So I can't help but wonder if this poem was in fact taken from the play The Duchess of Malfi, as in, it is, I wonder if it is an extract Oh, it does say here, actually, dull lamentation. So even when this book was written, they weren't... The author wasn't convinced. The anthologist, I should say, wasn't convinced you would know what they mean by dull. Anyway, The Shrouding of the Duchess of Malfi. Hark, now everything is still. The screech owl and the whistler shrill. Call upon our dame aloud. 
and bid her quickly don her shroud. Much you had of land and rent, your length in clay is now competent. A long war disturbed your mind, here your perfect peace is signed. Of what ist fools make such vain keeping, sin their conception, their birth weeping, their life a general mist of error, their death a hideous storm of terror. Strew your hair with powders sweet, don clean linen bathe your feet. And the foul fiend more to check, a crucifix, a crucifix let bless your neck. Tis now full tide between night and day, end your groan and come away. Right, so what do we have? Hark, now everything is still, the screech owl and the whistler shrill, so everything's quiet. Call upon a dame aloud and bid her quickly don her shroud. Uh, interesting, I'm not sure what the cultural significance of a lady wearing a shroud would be. I mean, I can think of some possibilities. One could be literally to obscure one's face. But that does seem a bit obvious in the sense that if someone were to walk down this street wearing a balaclava you would wonder what they're up to another possibility is it could be a funeral shroud um, that is I mean a shroud worn by someone by for example a widow after their partner has died um, I think technically speaking what I said was wrong, I think a shroom, I could be wrong, I think a, sh a funeral shroud, strictly speaking, would be for the deceased. But I was thinking more in terms of part of the longer period of lamentation after one's death. Because that was certainly a done thing. Also for marriage, you might wear a shroud. But aside from those contexts, I can't think when one would wear a shroud, other than maybe for fashion at certain points in time. Much you had of land and rent, your length in clay is now competent. As long war disturbed your mind, here your perfect peace is signed. What do I mean by competent? Your length in clay in clay is now competent. A long war disturbed your mind. Here your perfect peace is signed. So this is just a theory. I'm going to have to read the rest of the poem again to uh, get a feel for whether this theory is correct or not. But what I'm thinking is could this be after someone died in war this might for example be the husband of the Duchess of Malfi or her son could they have died and then the is she wearing a shroud a black shroud as a proper sign of her grief and the here your perfect piece is signed could be a reference to you've died. We'll have to see. Your length in clay is now competent. See that could be a reference to burying someone. Clay meaning the earth and your length because you'd need a hole that's the same size as you to bury you. But I don't know what that means by competent in this context. Which is what I'm looking up.
nearly there. Compete, competence, competent, properly qualified to do for a task, legally qualified, judge, court, witness, or things belonging, permissible to, as it was competent to him to refuse. Hence, competently, properly qualified to do for a task, legally qualified, of things belonging, permissible, see, permissible I can understand, as it was competent to him to refuse meaning as it was permissible for him to refuse. What does it mean by belonging? Having sufficient skill, having jurisdiction, adequate for the purpose. See, that's what I'm thinking is most likely. Permutable permeable to foreign DNA, resistant to deformation or flow. None of those reflect the belonging sense. Hmm. Your length in clay is now competent. See, the only sense in which I could understand that at all would be to say it's adequate for the purpose where the purpose is unspoken that meaning to be buried in so again my, that, that would mean that we the reader are being portrayed as the deceased we're the one being addressed and we are the deceased which is interesting if I'm right in this in my guesswork as to what this means. Of what is fools make such vain keeping? Right, what do they mean by keeping? Keeping in VBL senses, verbal probably, in verbal senses, also or especially uh, or custody charge as in safekeeping, in his keeping, agreement harmony, originally of painting as in out of keeping. Oh, that's true. Fit for keeping. As keeping apples. Keeping room, sitting room usually occupied. Hmm. Conformity or harmony, the songs are new but keep it in keeping with tradition. The foreground of the painting is not in keeping. Change or care, maintenance, support, provision, feed, cattle of good keeping. Of what is it fools make such vain keeping? Of what is it fools make such vain keeping? Maintenance, provision, sin their conception, their birth weeping. The life, a general mist of error. Oh, that's a good expression. The death, a hideous storm of terror. <sighs> Strew your hair with powders sweet. Don't clean linen, bathe your feet. I think this is all describing the process of preparing a body, probably. And the foul fiend, more to check. A crucifix, a crucifix let bless your neck. Again, this I don't know for certain, because I don't know a great deal about Elizabethan funeral practices, but this all seems 
consistent with we are the deceased. It is now full tide between night and day. End your groan and come away. Full tide. What would full tide mean? No help there. Let me double check keeping again in my physical dictionary. Harmony. In keeping, out of keeping, etc. Fit for keeping. Not much use there. Vain keeping. I can only imagine keeping might be an analogy for life, as in how one maintains himself. You know, such as, <laughs> for example, one's occupation and one's social circle, how one supports oneself and continues the act of how one carries on I suppose is what I'm trying to get at get at or what is fools make such vain keeping but I could be a million miles off that doesn't fully figure to me what's the other one that's gonna look up uh, Tide, wasn't it? Tide, time, season. Even tide, Whitson tide, Christmas tide, Yule tide. Otherwise archaic. A period of time as work double tides, night and day. That makes sense then. It is now full tide between, between night and day. So it's now full time between night and day. So does that mean exactly between night and day? So sunset? Or sunrise, one or the other? That would be my best guess. So. Hark, now everything is still. The screech owl and the whistler shrill. Call upon her dame aloud and bid her quickly don her shroud. Much you had of land and rent. Your length in clay is now competent. A long war disturbed your mind. Here your perfect peace is signed. Of what is fools make such vain keeping? Sin their conception, their birth a weeping. The life a general mist of error. The death a hideous storm of terror. Strew your hair with powder sweet. Don clean linen, bathe your feet. And the foul fiend more to check. A crucifix, let, a crucifix let bless your neck. It is now full tide between night and day. End your groan and come away. Yep, I would suggest this is the Duke. I suggest we, the reader, are the Duke and we have passed on. We had a lot of land and rent in our lifetime. But we also didn't keep ourselves in the best, best manner. Sin their conception, their birthing weeping. Is that a reference to being a 
child born out of wedlock, I wonder. Because that's peculiar if they're a duke. Unless they were the illegitimate son of a king. Then that might happen. They're both weeping. Which I think could be a reference to the fact that all children weep when they're born. Well, not all children do, but many babies cry when they're born. And then they then try, the poet is trying to imply that this is more meaning than you might think. That they're actually sad. Or it could be, since the actual person isn't addressed, just implied, that it could mean that someone else is weeping when they're born, such as their mother, if they're born out of wedlock. Um, very hard to say. It does make me wonder if this could be a poem about a certain group of people's lives, which could be nobility that are born out of wedlock. And that, you know, they're born, they're conceived through sin, and then their whole life is a general mist of errors. And then this particular duke has met their end um, at war. But a lot of that is supposition on my part, so I could be a long way off. Anyway, I unfortunately I find myself growing fatigued. So I think we'll move on a little early to the riddles and uh, also finish the stream a little earlier than usual. Sorry about that. Uh, still, we'll only be slightly early. So, 153, which I assume is the one, the last one we looked at last week. I've heard of one of humankind, but yet without a human mind. Who oft is seen from many a plain, here and there, and here again, but chiefly when the sun from high descends and views the nether sky, he with great swiftness daily moves o'er hills and dales and shady groves, and yet this mighty man of fame is but a creature of the brain. Then tell me, ladies, if you can, who is this fancied wondrous man? And the answer was Jack a lantern, which I didn't fully understand. It sounds as though this was a reference to some folklore which I didn't know. But I could be wrong. After looking at after looking it up, it did seem like Jack O' Lantern was in fact a reference at one level to Jack O' Lantern, as we would likely pronounce it today. As in a pumpkin that's been hollowed out, had a face carved into it and then a candle put inside but I, I just you read this riddle and you think there's something more to it there's something else being described here some context which is lost anyway so the next riddle is I'm neither rich ingenious nor fair my colors coarser than in negroes are I'm dull and sordid clad in base attire which oft is covered o'er oh, with dust and mire, and yet more rivals for my person strive than for the fairest noble nymph alive. The extremes of various fortunes oft I try, sometimes cast down, sometimes exalted high, yet not my squalid form or abject state, the ardour of my lovers can abate, for still the more I their approach elude, with greater industry I am pursued, for when obtained so much contempt I meet, the lover kicks and spurns me with his feet. Interesting. Clad in base attire. The extremes of various fortune oft I try, sometimes cast down, sometimes exalted high. 
Yet not my squalid form or abject state, the ardour of my lovers can abate. For still the more I their approach elude, with greater industry I am pursued. For when obtained, so much contempt I meet, the lover kicks and spurns me with his feet. The most, the best I can think of is something like coal, and the reason I'm thinking that is one, the reference to being of a very dark colour, two, the fact that it would be very desirable, especially during the Industrial Revolution, but three, at least through Santa Claus, there's a reference to coal being considered something undesirable. The idea that it's something that one wouldn't want to receive, as though it's almost an insulting or demeaning present. Bit of a long shot though. Well, let's see, shall we? What was it? One five four, I think. A football. Oh, interesting. I suppose footballs of that era were very dark. Something I didn't know. I'm neither rich and genius nor fair. My colour's coarser than e Negroes are. I'm dull and sword, clad in base attire, with stuff is covered over with dust and mire. Okay, base attire must be whatever the outer layer of the football was made from. I don't know how they were constructing them back then, but presumably there's an inner part and something that goes around it. And yet more rivals for my person strive than for the fairest noble nymph alive. The extremes of various fortunes oft I try, sometimes cast down, sometimes exalted high. So the idea about, I suppose exalted high is being kicked very high in the air and cast down, being allowed to fall to the ground, I guess. Yet not my squalid form, what abject state, the ardour of my lovers can abate. So no matter how much they love me, they can't improve my condition in life. For still the more I there approach elude, with greater industry I am pursued. That makes sense. If someone's keeping the football from you, then you are likely to pursue it with greater ardour. But when obtained, so much contempt I meet, the lover kicks and spurns me with his feet. So I missed the point of that reference. That's reasonably clever. Right, we'll do another 155. Come, learn of me the force of parts alone, and what great things by stirring may be done. I, who was born to neither house nor land, have now vast heaps of wealth at my command. And yet to gain this power I nothing do, but all to others active hands I owe. I ne'er to civil or to common law was bred, 
nor taught for fees in noisy courts to plead. Yet titles to estates are oft tried by me, and I the doubtful case decide, and give such turns to things, that spite of merit, the rightful heirs do an estate inherit, yet I to strangers' hands can soon transfer it. There's not a term, no court in Westminster, but there are those can what I say aver, and yet I'm known to have no eloquence, no charms of speech, or even common sense. What appears of me, I must own, is smooth. I never huff, but then do you think I'll soothe? No faith, that's sordid. Cringing mortals use such sneaking arts and such mean methods choose, whose oily tongues can sleekly, smoothly glide. I carry all by using my rough side. Then how they storm and damn and swear to see themselves outdone by such a one as me. So choose by such an empty, brainless fool, and gold of all by such a worthless tool. And then next time they chance to meet with me, they seek revenge and use me barbarously. I have no sight, but though so blind I be, to show how small advantage it is to see, to manage those I make my constant trade, who have eyes full as thick as Argus head. But that you may at these great wonders guess, one secret truth I freely will confess, Though one and of sallow hue my face is, know I'm mightly in the ladies' graces. To them I therefore for my name appeal, sure that they use me, who I am can tell. Interesting. It's not going to be time. Could be fortune. But you can't exactly use fortune, can you? Sure they that use me, who am I can tell. Sorry, who I am can tell. Carry it all by using my rough side.
Mm, best guess I've got is fortune. It makes sense for a lot of it, but not absolutely all of it. Dice. Oh, of course. I was on the right lines, as in thinking about things like Lady Luck, but I wasn't quite there. I'm neither rich and genius nor fair. My colour's coarser than in Negroes are. Nope, that's the previous one. Come, learn of me the force of parts alone, and what great things by stirring may be done. Stirring, as in rolling dice. I, who was born to neither house nor land, have now vast heaps of wealth at my command. Again, makes a lot of sense. And yet to gain this power, I nothing do, but all to others active hands I owe. Again, another clue to dice that I missed. I ne'er to civil or to common law was bred, nor taught for fees in noisy courts to plead. Yet titles to estates are often tried by me, and I the doubtful case decide, and give such turns to things that, despite of merit, the rightful heirs do an estate inherit, yet I to strangers' hands can soon transfer it. There's not a term, no court in Westminster, but there are those that, what I say, aver, and yet I'm known to have no eloquence, no charms of speech, or even common sense. What appears of me, I must only smooth. I never huff, but then, do you think I'll soothe? No faith, let sordid, cringing mortals use such sneaking arts, and such mean methods choose, whose oily tongues can sleekly, smoothly glide. I carry all by using my rough side. Then how they storm! and damn and swear to see themselves outdone by such a one as me so choosed by such an empty brainless fool and gold of all by such a worthless tool and then next time they chance to meet with me they seek revenge and use me barbarously i have no sight but though so blind i be to show how small advantage tis to see to manage those i make to my constant trade of eyes full as thick as argus's head but that you may at these great wondrous guess, one secret truth I freely will confess. The one and sallow of a hue my face, sallow hue my face is, though I'm mightily in the ladies' graces, to them I therefore for my name appeal. Sure that, sure they that use me, who I am can tell. I wouldn't have got that reference, that ladies in particular were associated with dice. That's interesting. That is interesting. Obviously, they would have played card games. I mean, that much is clear. But interesting they'd be described as being mightily in the latest graces. I wonder why. Anyway. Uh, I think we'll stop there for tonight. So thank you for coming, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be streaming again on Friday, and Saturday, and Monday, and those will be more of the Talus Principle, and then on Wednesday we'll be back round to Poetry and Riddles. So, once again, thank you for coming, and I hope you all have a wonderful night. Good night!